Hello and welcome to another Ask GC Anything. This week is a special maintenance themed episode. You can tell that because of my change of location and also because I'm wearing an apron. Oh yeah, that means it's business time. Not like that, that would be weird. Okay, first up we've got a question sent in from Andrew Wrightisma about lubrication. Steady. Uh, he says, uh, hello from Down Under. Hello. Uh, how often in kilometres should a chain be re-lubed in dry weather and should it be degreased every time prior to lubing? Wow, that is an absolute can of worms to get things kicked off with. A lot of people have very strong beliefs about looking after their chains and rightly so, it's an important part of the bike. But I think it's also possible to overthink things in terms of trying to eke another couple of hundred kilometres of life out of your chain maybe it's not worth getting obsessed about. But there is definite do's and don'ts here. I would say as a rule, re-lube your chain if it's starting to get dry and noisy, but otherwise I wouldn't bother. And then in terms of degreasing, I'd look to see what the kind of condition of the chain is inside the links, so between the rollers, because that's where a chain will get worn. And if it's full of grit and sand and things like that, that's the point at which you want to clean it until it's sparkling like new. Definitely worth looking at what kind of degreaser you use. Don't use any really abrasive, acidic or alkaline solvents. Then that's not very good for the life of your chain. Most manufacturers would say definitely steer clear. But a normal bike specific degreaser will do the job nicely every once in a while. But there are no rules because at the end of the day, where you ride might be different to where I ride in the dry. And you know, like I say, it's impossible to put an exact number on it. But hopefully that helps. And if nothing else, there should be some good comments in the comment section down below. Right then, next up, we've got this one from Tom Cruise. Cool name, Tom. What is actually the benefit or importance of stiffness on a bike? When, why do I need a stiff bike? Well, that is a very good question, actually. People generally think that a stiff bike is important for power transfer. So you press on the cranks and all of your power goes straight to the back wheel because the bike's not flexing. However, that ignores an important point, which is that generally energy will not be lost in that system. Obviously energy can't be lost, it just goes transferred somewhere else. So theoretically, if your bike flexes, it's also gonna give you that energy back somehow. So that is point one, I guess, but stiff bikes do certainly feel better under power transfer. But actually, what I think is that a stiff bike's really good in terms of handling. So I think a stiff front end on your bike is a very good thing for making a bike feel great when you're going around corners but it's certainly not important. You can ride very fast on a very flexy bike. Okay, next up we've got Hazik Anis. Is a bottom bracket interchangeable? Can a 24 mil crank spindle fit in a BB30 with some adapters? Uh, yes, it can. You've actually got one here, I think. There we go. So FSA make little adapters. So this one goes from a BB386 Evo bottom bracket or a, yeah, and it will go down, this is specifically for SRAM's GXP, so that's a 20 something mil spindle, I think. Have a look online, you can definitely get adapters, but you can't necessarily adapt all bottom brackets to fit all types of crank. So proceed with caution, but yeah, definitely you can do something. Okay, next up, we've got this one from Patrick Joseph. Uh, almost every bike shop tells you to bring your new bike back after a few weeks to retune the gearing. Is that just an excuse to sell you more stuff? Uh, no, it's definitely not. Uh, cables, uh, we say that they stretch. The cables themselves don't stretch, but all the housing and stuff can compress down and that can make your gears just a little bit out of tune. And so all the bike shop needs to do is just tweak the barrel adjuster. But it's definitely something that you can do as well at home. We've got a great video on the subject. In actual fact, we're going to play a bit of it now. Now, if your derailleur doesn't sit exactly beneath each cog in turn when you're changing gear, then the gears are not indexed, which is at which point then they're gonna be working badly. And it's the process of indexing to correct that and to move the derailleur into the right place. And you can micro adjust it very simply. Okay, we've got a really good question left under last week's YouTube video. This one from Lee C Bracing, or Lee C B Racing, I'm not sure which, anyway. They've asked, why do pros sit so far forward on the saddle? Uh, mainly it's because when you're riding really aggressively and really fast on flat roads, you naturally want to get really low. And by getting really low, it means that your hips will rotate forward and therefore to stay comfortable and to keep getting the power out, 
you'll naturally want to slip further forward as well. It's actually not a new thing. Uh, it's been around for an awful long time, and it's actually the reason why we have the phrase on the rivet, uh, which is a nice bit of cycling trivia for you. It comes from when saddles used to be riveted, and people would slide forward on the seat and literally sit on the rivet at the front there. Uh, the one thing that is new actually now is the fact that positions are getting lower and more stretched out at the front, so saddles are going ever further forward and now also angled down. And Matt did a really, really great video uh, at the recent Tour of Dubai, and that one is going to play just in one second. Worth checking out to get a bit more information. The pros are renowned for their aggressive, slammed riding positions, but of late there's been an increasing trend towards the extreme. Now, when you consider that my bike is pretty slammed, and by that I mean there's a big differential between bar and saddle height, the same as when I was racing, and you compare it to the extremely aggressive position of Johan van Siel, you will know what I mean. Now, we talked to a few riders about why they seem to be taking things, position-wise, to the extreme. Right then, quick fire question round now. Always probably the slowest part of the entire video, but as that said, Nathan commented uh, last week, uh, average speed definitely doesn't matter during the rapid fire question round, so thank you very much for that, Nathan. Uh, question number one, though, Liam Bradley, uh, he's got an issue with his rear wheel. Sometimes when he pedals, it works fine and he moves forward. Other times, the pedal arms just spin and nothing happens. What's going on? Uh, well, that is quite a common uh, complaint if your rear wheel is getting really old and it's the free wheel. So the bit that allows, that sounds really nice and clicks and it actually allows you to not pedal and coast and then also pedal. Uh, basically, they can get a bit jammed up with gunk and general crap over time. And so the little springy bits that actually allow you to coast stop springing, basically, in a nutshell. Uh, it could well be that you can fix it, so you maybe need to check out your manufacturer's uh, website and see whether they've got any instructions on there. But there is a chance that maybe your free wheel can't be fixed and therefore it may well be terminal. So definitely check online first. Uh, most of the free wheels that we've got in GCN bikes here I think can be fixed. So hopefully, hopefully you will be in luck. I'm sure you will be. Okay, we've now got one from Oreo says B00. That's a weird name, that. Uh, why do pros race with 25C tyres if 28C tyres save you two to three watts per wheel? Now, someone's already had a very good go at answering this. Leonard Meinke, who said, uh, it's a little bit of aero and lots of tradition. And I tell you what, that's actually not far from the truth. Sometimes it takes a while for scientific thought to actually filter down into the pro peloton, because at the end of the day, how something feels and what people think is also really, really important as well. And a lot of pros feel that 28s are slower than 25s, even though maybe the data says something different. Having said that, 28s are a little bit heavier than 25s and they are less aerodynamic. Clearly there's more surface area to break through the wind. Um, but I suspect that we will start seeing pros use more 28s, particularly as wheels get wider as well. So that obviously offsets some of the aerodynamic disadvantages. Right, following on from that, uh, we've got a question from Amori uh, who has said they've just got a new Canyon Air Road for fast rides. They will be fast. Uh, what do you recommend for tyre sizes, 25 or 28 mil Continental GP 4002s? Well, given what I've just said, 28s do fit very comfortably in there. And if you ride on particularly really poor abrasive tarmac, then running 50 psi in there will mean that you're bike rolls like a magic carpet and you will go very, very fast indeed. If, however, you are riding on super smooth tarmac and aerodynamics are everything and your average speed is super high, then you may still want to go with 25s, but I definitely would go with the 28s on there, that's for sure. Okay, uh, we've now got a series of questions all linked together as well. Dan Fish, unfortunately, has just broken his collarbone and he wants to know how he can use his turbo training to keep the fitness that he's got. Uh, despite this period of convalescence. So you definitely can with a turbo trainer and you don't even have to spend all that long in there. Have a look through the GCN archives of training sessions and if you did maybe a, one of our 20 or 30 minute sessions every other day, you'll probably find actually that you'll keep your fitness. Uh, it's incredible how little you need to do in order to stay fit, uh, even if it's a bit harder to get fit in the first place. But one thing I did notice at the weekend, Stephen Cummings won the British National Road Race Champs and the British National Time Trial Champs, having not raced for ages because he got really bad injuries after a crash at the Tour of the Basque Country. 
and he did all of his training on Zwift, actually, almost right up until the Nationals itself, including some pretty punchy rides of four hours plus. So if you've got that option open to you, uh, with the smart train, or even if you haven't, all you need is a couple of sensors, then maybe Zwift could well be your answer with a broken collarbone like so many pros are doing at the moment. Linking on neatly to the next question, which was sent in by Sanrish Shedekar, uh, who's saying that uh, his FTP on the road is 245 watts, but on Zwift, his FTP comes down to 205 watts. Uh, he suffers a lot. Can we tell him why? What should he do? Well, there are various different reasons why your FTP is generally a little bit lower inside. But one of the big ones is actually heat, because our bodies don't like getting too hot. Uh, and without the cooling effect of the wind, even with a really good fan in front of you, you will still find that your FTP probably comes down a little bit. So that will be the reason why. You can try and train in an air-conditioned place with more fans. That will certainly help matters. But as long as you train and test yourself in the same environment, so always test it outside or always test it inside, then actually it's not a problem if it's always 35 watts lower inside. It's just, you know that it's because you're hot, and so you can just leave it there. But, final linked question, are you ready for this? Okay, uh, B Rider says, we've all heard of altitude training, is there such a thing as heat training? Yeah, there is. Yeah, you can train uh, to get better in the heat. So if, for example, you live in a cold and wet country like England, but you are training for an event that's going to be in a nice hot sunny country, then yeah, actually it's a really good idea to do a little bit of heat acclimatization before you go. And you don't need to do all that much. Um, so back when I was racing, I got told to do some turbo training, not intense, but just riding, but in a really hot, humid room, uh, maybe even your bathroom. I believe Matt did it in his garage once. Uh, and as long as you really start to get a sweat on, you do that for an hour a day, every day for five days before you travel, that should get you heat acclimatized. So there you go, heat training. Uh, right, how was that for quickfire then? Probably not terribly quick, but hopefully the question's got answered all right. And I guess that's the point. You can always rename it, call it something different. Next up, we got a question from Gabriel Blanchfield. Uh, he's got an odd creaking sound coming from his crank set area. Uh, there's no visible damage, the bike's well maintained, and it only occurs when he's in the big ring. I feel for you because tracking down creeks on bikes can be a frustrating process. Handily, Lasty's bike is hanging just next to me. So if it creaks when you're in the big ring, then it could well be because you're just putting more torque through the bike and that's why it's creaking. It could well be your chainring bolts. So I'd suggest that you have a look at those, make sure they're all tightened up properly. Uh, although they don't tend to make a creaking noise, they tend to make like a clicking noise. It could well be your bottom bracket but before you go down that route uh, and get all cross, then I'd suggest that you actually check out a video that we've got uh, about how to track down creeks on your bike. Uh, from that video, we then had to go and make four more because there's so many different permutations, such as, for example, I had a creek that happened. I was sure it was coming from my crank set, and every time I got out of the saddle, and it turned out it was my front quick release. I kid you not, but there we go. Much easier to deal with than a bottom bracket. Anyway, the video is going to play just now. Have a look. A clicking, squeaking bike is deeply annoying and it can genuinely ruin your ride. No bike is immune from the curse, even at top of the range superbikes are susceptible. Now, as well as ruining your ride, it can also be a sign of something much more serious. For example, when carbon is damaged and in danger of failing, it can make an almighty creaking noise. So it's always a good idea to pay attention to the signs, even if you can actually put up with the noise. Random Bike Trips sent in a really good question under last week's show. What is the ideal position or angle to set your handlebars at? You see some that are in a slight incline and some that are angled downwards. Well, a lot depends on the shape of your handlebars, but also it's personal preference. Uh, and actually it can change over time. Mine certainly has. Uh, on Lasty's bike here is an integrated handlebar and stem, so he actually has no choice. And so you can see that Trek have decided that that is the optimum angle. And actually I'd go for that as well. Two things you probably want to look at. Firstly, the angle of the handlebar next to your brake hood. Uh, so do you like it to go down or do you like a smooth transition? Most people tend to go for a smooth transition now. The other thing is that can you hold the drops comfortably? So that bit there has to be an angle that's comfortable for your wrist. So generally you don't want too much bending of your wrist because that'd be uncomfortable for long periods of time. Uh, either way, up or down. So kind of generally you want your wrist in a neutral position and then for it to feel nice transitioning from your handlebar to your brake hoods. 
we have a video on the subject there. Hopefully that will give you a little bit more information. I'd check it out now if I was you. The first point we'll cover is handlebar width. Now, road handlebars typically come in sizes from 38 to 46 centimetres wide. And typically, you would choose a handlebar based on your height. Except that height doesn't really have anything to do with it. It's actually the width of your shoulders. So traditionally, you would choose a handlebar that is the same width as the distance between your AC joints. So that's the knobbly bits on your shoulders there. So that when you hold the handlebars in the drops, your knuckles are just outside the line of your shoulders. Okay, well, hopefully I've answered your question. Uh, if I haven't got around to answering yours this week, then obviously make sure you stick it in the comments section down below again. And if you've got a new question entirely or you're new to the show, then submit your questions in the comments section down below or on social media using the hashtag TalkBack. Now, before leaving this video, do make sure you subscribe to GCN. It's very simple, just click on the globe. And then if you want more content right now, then why not click just there for our Tour de France preview show, given that it's starting tomorrow or potentially even already by the time you watch this video. Get up to speed with that one there. And then for a Dan and Matt classic, nine ways to drink from your water bottle. Who knew there was more than one? Click just down there.